getting the most out of yourself and others. Giving hints from his newest book, Top Performance, Zig on this tape combines live presentations with personal messages for you as he shares tried and true applications of people management practices. Zig teaches with warmth, wit, and backs up the principles with solid guidelines for your application. So let's not wait any longer. Let's go straight to Zig Ziglar. 15% of the reason you get a job, keep that job, and move ahead in that job is determined by your technical skills and knowledge, regardless of your profession. That's what human engineer Calvert Roberts says. What about the other 85%? Calvert quotes Stanford Research Institute, Harvard University, and the Carnegie Foundation, which incidentally spent a million dollars in five years in the research, as having proved that 85% of the reason you get a job will keep that job and move ahead in that job has to do with your people skills and people knowledge. I'm completely convinced he's right. As I travel around the country sharing ideas on personal growth, sales training, and the corporate concepts we teach at the Zig Ziglar Corporation, I become more and more aware of the critical need for specialized instruction on how we can manage ourselves and others for maximum effectiveness. As I visit with professionals from all walks of life, I see common problems in many, if not all, of the different situations men and women are facing. And the common denominator in these problems is always the same, people. So obviously, managing people, starting with yourself, becomes a high priority if we are to be successful. According to Megatrends author John Nesbitt, for the reinvented Information Age Corporation of 1985 and beyond, the challenge is retraining managers, not retraining workers. With this in mind, the ultimate goal of top performance is to develop excellence in managers and to provide management with teaching procedures and inspiration to effectively develop and utilize team members. The foundation for developing yourself and others is wrapped up in this principle. You can have everything in life you want if you will just help enough other people get what they want. I've used this statement for nearly 30 years as a foundational truth, and never is the concept more accurate than when managing yourself and others. However, it is important for you to understand that I'm talking about a principle and not a tactic. As a tactic, the words would be crass and ineffective. As a principle, the concept works because it makes others want your leadership. A good friend of mine, Mary Crowley, says, we are free up to the point of choice. Then the choice controls the chooser. Our success in life is determined by the choices we make. You are going to be making choices that will determine your success as you learn to manage yourself and others. To be effective in making proper choices, you must understand the difference between reacting and responding. It was January the 23rd, 1981. It was a Friday. It had been one of those weeks. I had been literally drove hard and hung up wet, as we'd say down home. I mean, I'd been about as busy as a man can get. That particular Friday morning, we had a four-hour recording session. Now, when you record, you got to move it up a notch because you don't have your body language and your eye contact to communicate. It's got to be all voice. So I was full speed ahead, wide open, 280 words a minute with gust up to 550. I mean, <laughs> it was all there. Well, at the end of the four hours, I wasn't just whipped, I was whooped. And there is, as I say, quite a difference in the two. We had a flight going back to Dallas, leaving at 3 o'clock. The airlines had said to us, now, because you've got all of this gear, you need to get out here at least an hour early so we can secure it. So straight up and down at 1 o'clock when I finished, my son-in-law, Chad Whitmire, who works with me, uh, packed up all of the gear as quickly as possible. We caught a cab, made a mad dash to the airport, got out there straight up and down 2 o'clock. As I walked in the front door, there were two humongous lines. And I picked out the one which I thought was the shortest and prepared to wait. But I noticed after it had been there just a moment or so that a little lady was walking around behind the counter. And I looked on one end and there was a sign which said position closed. My experience told me that pretty soon position closed was going to swing open over to position open. So I got ready. I wanted to be the first in that new line. And sure enough, about a minute later, down comes position closed, up goes position open, and the little lady looked out at the two long lines of people and smilingly said, those of you who have a seat on the 3 o'clock flight to Dallas, 
Come over here. Well, quick like a bunny rabbit, I'll tell you. I was over there, first in line. Little lady looked at me and grinned as she said, the three o'clock flight to Dallas has been canceled. <laughs> I said, fantastic. She said, what'd you say? I said, fantastic. She said, now I gotta ask you, I've just told you your flight's been canceled and you say it's fantastic. Now, why would you say a thing like that? And I said, ma'am, it's very simple. There are only three reasons on the face of this earth why anybody would ever cancel a flight to Dallas, Texas. I said, number one, something must be wrong with that airplane. Or number two, something must be wrong with a man gonna fly that airplane. Or number three, something must be wrong with the weather that man gonna fly that airplane in. Now, if either one of those three situations exist, I don't want to be up there. I want to be right down here. Fantastic. She said, yeah, but the next flight doesn't leave until 6.05. I said, fantastic. Well, by now the other two long lines are people are looking over as if to say, who is that nut that says everything is fantastic? So I said, ma'am, uh, you know, as she responded to me rather by saying, why would you say it's fantastic when I tell you uh, that you're going to have a four hour wait here in the airport in Kansas City? I said, ma'am, it's very simple. I said, I am 54 years old and never before, not even once in my entire lifetime, have I ever had a chance to spend four solid hours in this airport here in Kansas City, Missouri. And I said, do you realize at this precise moment there literally are tens of millions of people on the face of this earth who not only are cold, but who also are hungry? And here I am in one of the most beautiful facilities in the whole world, bitterly cold outside, but nice and warm on the inside. And there's a nice coffee shop right down away, going to go down there, get myself a cup of coffee, going to do some relaxing for just a few minutes. Then I've got some critically important writing, which I must get done. And who can think of a better place than a beautiful facility like this for me to do my creative work? I say it's fantastic. Now, those of you who might have picked up just on this particular segment of the Born to Win program might be thinking to yourself, well, I've heard about those positive thinkers. But that's ridiculous, Ziggler. <laughs> now, uh, you know, you might also be wondering to yourself, I wonder if he really said that. Tell me the truth, Ziggler. Is that really what you said? Well, as we'd say down home, scouts, honor folks, that is exactly what I said. Okay, you said it now. Tell me this. Is that the way you felt? I mean, did you really feel that way? Tell me the truth, Ziggler. Did you feel that way? Well, of course not. <laughs> At least initially, I did not feel that way. Many, many different times in many, many different ways, whether you respond or react is going to determine just how high you're going to go in the game of life. You see, to respond is positive. To react is negative. I chose to respond for very one or two or three very simple reasons. You see, I don't have ulcers. I don't want ulcers. I don't need ulcers. I honestly don't think I will ever have ulcers because I respond instead of react. You see, you go to the doctor and you're sick and he gives you a prescription and says, see me tomorrow. And if you go back the next day and he begins to shake his head and say, uh-oh, your body is reacting to the medicine, then everybody gets upset. But if he looks at you and says, oh boy, your body is responding to this medicine, then you're really going to get excited because you know it's doing you some good. You see, folks, you do good when you respond, but you're not doing so good when you react. You see, I responded for that reason. Now, I had a couple of reactions I actually could have had. You know, I could have gotten pretty sarcastic when, he, when she told me that the next flight didn't leave until 6.05 or that my flight had been canceled. I could have said, that's great. That's just great. I break my silly neck running through all this traffic trying to get out here, you know, to catch a plane as you had told me to do, expecting it to leave. And I get here and you tell me that you've canceled a flight. Well, let me tell you something. When I drove up, I noticed that you've got a dozen airplanes sitting out there not doing a cotton picking thing. Now, why can't you let me get on one of those and go down to Dallas? Why can't you do that? Just answer that question. I could have done that. And the next flight still leaves at 
five. <laughs> uh, folks, let me tell you something. There are some things you just are not going to change. If you're black, you're going to stay black. If you're white, you're going to stay white. You're not going to add one cubit. I don't care how much you think about it to your height. You're not going to change who your parents were or where you were born. You are not going to change a thing which has happened in the past. That is over and done with. But the question is, do you respond to situations and make them positive or do you react which is negative see i could have had another reaction i could have ranted and raved and whooped and shouted and snorted and screamed and hollered i could have gotten obnoxious and made a complete idiot out of myself right then and there i could have said that's crazy who's a dumb dumb that made such an idiotic decision anyhow i want to go to dallas i've been gone all week long my family misses me and i miss my family let me see the man who made this dumb decision i want to see him right now I could have done that. And the next flight <laughs> still leaves at 6 5. I know that many of you are very familiar with what happened when our president was shot in 1981. You know what happened at the sound of the gunshot, and I'm absolutely convinced he is alive today because the men who had been assigned to guard his life responded in a very positive way. At the sound of the gunshot, they instantly moved him into the back seat of the limousine and they sped off to the hospital. And it's only been in the last few months that we have learned that we came within a whisper of losing our president. The way our president himself responded to me said a whole lot about the man himself. You remember the scene? He was there in excruciating pain. He was absolutely almost in shock. His wife was there scared to death. The television cameras were on him and he looked at her and smilingly said, Honey, I just forgot to duck. <laughs> and 200 million Americans said, At a boy, Ron. There's my president. I learned more about him in two minutes than I'd learned about him in many, many years by watching him respond. You see, I could watch you for uh, six months or a year or two years, follow you around and watch everything you do, and I could learn a whole lot about you. But the truth of the matter is, I can watch you under adverse circumstances for two minutes. And I can learn as much about you when the pressure is on, when things are not going well, when things are tough. I can learn more about you in two minutes than I can normally by watching you for days and weeks and months. Do you respond or do you react? Suppose at the sound of the gunshot, those men assigned to protect the president's life, suppose one of them had said, Did, did, did you hear that? <laughs> Well, 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 wonder what that was, you know. And suppose the president, suppose he said, oh no, here I am, 70 years old, I've worked all of my life for this job, and now 68 days after I get it, somebody shoots me, it's not fair. You see, the way you respond is important. Do you respond or do you react? You see, the truth of the matter is, I did not know a single soul at that big old airline. I mean, not a one. Didn't know the president or the chairman of the board or the ticket agent or a single stewardess. And as far as I was concerned, though it was their airline, they could literally cancel my flight. But there's no way they're going to cancel my day. You see, the day is mine. As a matter of fact, God himself gave it to me. He even told me to rejoice in this specific day. No, I'm going to let them cancel my flight because it's their airline. I'm not going to let them cancel my day because it belongs to me to use productively. You see, I don't know if you've ever been guilty of this, but I know some people, you know, maybe they're riding down the freeway on the way to their job in the morning, you know, uh, neither thinking negative or positive. I mean, they're just kind of in neutral. And all of a sudden, some idiot pulls right in front of them and they hit their brakes and the horn all at the same time and they shake their fist, you know, I mean, they really get after them. Why don't you watch where you're going, you dumb bunny? I could have been killed. Not only do they proceed to give them a piece of their mind there, but when they get down to the office, they rant and they rave and they whoop and they shout and they snort and they scream and they holler and they just carry on. Why don't they make people around here get licenses? They don't know how to drive here. I mean, this is wild. This is crazy. <laughs> Hour, two hours, three hours, they're still talking about the dodo that pulled in front of them. And in the meantime... The man who committed the dastardly deed rides merrily along, <laughs> completely unaware of the fact that you even exist. 
but he is in complete control of your life, telling you how to think and how to act and how to feel, affecting your uh, attitude with your fellow employees and affecting your productivity tremendously. And you see, folks, that's just not a good idea. That's one of the reasons we're going to get into a formula here in a few minutes about what you can do to build an attitude formula or foundation so solidly uh, that when somebody does rain on your parade, when things don't go exactly like you want them to go, your attitude is still going to be good. Now, we've got lots to overcome because, you know, this started long time ago. It really started in the Garden of Eden. You remember the scene God had given Adam and Eve, I mean absolutely everything thing, paradise. He said, now you can have it all except there's one tree that has some fruit on it. You can't eat it. Well, you know the story. They ate the fruit. Then the Lord came walking in the garden that evening. And as I said earlier, this conversation is not going to be verbatim. But the Lord came walking in the garden, you know, and he said, Adam, where are you? Over here, Lord. Adam, did you eat that fruit? Simple question. He doesn't want a theological answer, just wants yes or no. But you know what Adam said? He said, Lord, let me tell you about that woman. <laughs> <laughs> the Lord said, Eve, did you eat that fruit? Simple question. Yes or no is all he wants. But Eve said, Lord, let me tell you about that serpent. <laughs> And, of course, the serpent didn't have a leg to stand on. <laughs> now, you know, what I'm going to say to you is that you don't have a leg to stand on either. When you blame other things and other people for your difficulty, I want to simply say to you uh, that you can learn to uh, respond instead of reacting. To be a top performer, you must make the proper choices. Now, if you've never had instructions on how to respond positively on what top performers do to become top performers, then you have a built-in excuse. But wait a minute. I'm not going to let you hang your hat on that excuse. Together, we're going to look at how, what, who, why, when, and where to make the proper choices so that you can get the most out of yourself and others. Now, here is a formula for success. I think you will agree that the responsibility of your organization, whether it is you and one other person, or you and a hundred other people, is to function together for a common cause or purpose. Unquestionably, the 1984 Olympics held in Los Angeles were a great triumph. One of the primary reasons was Peter Uberoff, the man in charge, the manager. Mr. Uberoff was successful, according to many of those who worked closely with him, because he made everyone believe they were involved in a cause that was bigger than the individual. The way he involved everyone in his and their cause was by using excellent people skills. He developed a team spirit and had everyone working together for the same end results. You can do the same thing with smaller or larger units by understanding a simple formula for success. Much has been written and said about team efforts. It's important for the family, for the athletic team, and for the workplace. Recently, a friend of mine was discussing a basketball team for which his son plays. The team was functioning quite well early in the season. There were no superstars on board, but they had learned considerable discipline and a series of plays which were enabling them to beat teams which actually had greater individual talent. They had a good record. Then two guys who had been ineligible regained their eligibility and joined the team at the change of semesters. As individuals, these two guys were bigger, stronger, faster, and they were better better shooters, but unfortunately they did not have the discipline, nor did they know the plays. The net result was though they had the talent, they actually were liabilities instead of assets to the team. Important point, they were liabilities because the coach did not have the courage to keep them on the bench until they learned the plays and developed the discipline to function as team members instead of individual talents. That coach, manager if you will, let himself 
his team, his supporters, and the two individuals down. As managers, we frequently have similar situations arise in which an individual might have great talent and ability, but because of certain personality traits, annoying habits, or refusal to function as part of the team, they became liabilities instead of assets. The most important function a manager has is to bring the individuals together as a team, in other words, to make them gel. In athletics, we hear coaches talk about team spirit. They sell their units on the importance of playing together for a common cause, winning. One of the catchwords that coaches use to describe unity is gel. They will say that the offense is just beginning to gel, or to be successful, the defense must gel. Of course, they're talking about players playing together and not as individuals, putting the objectives of the unit ahead of personal gain so that when the unit wins, there will be great gain for each member of the team. Some reporters have spelled gel with a J because of the television commercials about gel o but actually gel means to congeal or come together. For our purposes, let's take the first three letters of gelatin and use them as an acrostic to remind us how to be experts in the business of managing people. The G in our gel formula stands for good finders. Those who are experts in top performance learn to look for the good in each person they manage. Andrew Carnegie said, no man can become rich without himself enriching others. He went on to live this philosophy as evidenced by the 43 millionaires he had working for him. A reporter interviewing Mr. Carnegie asked how he was able to hire that many millionaires. Mr. Carnegie patiently explained that the men were not millionaires when they came to work for him, but had become millionaires by working for him. When the reporter pursued the line of questioning as to how he was able to develop these men to the point they were worth that much money, Mr. Carnegie said, When you work with people, it's a lot like mining for gold. When you mine for gold, you must literally move tons of dirt to find a single ounce of gold. However, you do not look for the dirt, you look for the gold. It works the same way when you want to develop people to their full potential. You must look for the gold, that is the good, and when you find it, you nurture it and bring it to fruition. An otherwise man expressed it this way. The greatest good we can do for others is not to share our riches with them, but to reveal theirs to them. The next illustration, which comes from my childhood, tells about an effective method of dealing with your people when they don't do their jobs as effectively or professionally as they can and should. As you listen to this, I encourage you to remember some wise words from Dr. Norman Vincent Peale. The trouble with most of us is that we would rather be ruined by praise than saved by criticism. My mother was a great teacher. She always showed us exactly how to do things. There's two things we were always certain of. Number one, we knew exactly what she expected from us, and that was our best. And we also knew that she was going to inspect to make certain she got what she expected. I never will forget that first day in the garden on my first solo assignment. Had to hold two rows of beans, and they were three and a half miles long. Well, they looked like they were three and a half miles long. Maybe just three, but when you're eight years old, they look like they were three and a half miles long. My mama showed me exactly how to hold the beans, and she said to me, now, son, when you get through, call me so I can look them over. Well, I finally got through, and I said, mama, I'm through. Now, my mama was a little bitty lady. She only weighed about 90 pounds. She was about five feet tall. At that time, she was slightly stooped. She always wore a cloth sunbonnet to protect her face from that hot Mississippi sun. And when my mama wasn't happy with anything, you could tell it as far away as you could see her. She had always fold her hands behind her back. She had always duck her head. She had always cock it slightly to the right. And she had always give her that little left to right motion that was saying, uh-uh. Well, when my mama started that left to right motion, I said, what's the matter, mama? And my mama, and she said, son, looks like you're going to have to lick this calf over. Now, how many of you folks in the audience do not know what that means? Good old Mississippi term. Okay, got some underprivileged people here who don't know what that means. What that means is, son, this is not satisfactory. You're going to have to do it again, is what she was really saying. But when Mama says you're going to have to lick this calf over, I looked at her and I kind of grinned. I said, Mama, I haven't been messing with the calf. I've been hoeing these beans. Mama kind of got tickled. She laughed and she said, well, son, what I mean is this. For most boys... 
this would be perfectly all right. But you're not most boys. You're my son. And my son can do better than this. One of the great teaching communication tools that I've ever heard used was that. You see, she had criticized the performance because it needed criticizing. But she had praised the performer because he needed the praise. Don't forget that William James of Harvard said a deep need in human nature is the craving to be appreciated. When you, the manager, fill that need, you've taken a mammoth step toward becoming a more effective manager. Remember, the G in our formula stands for good finder. The E in our jail formula is for expect the best. I was sharing some of the ideas I've been explaining to you in a seminar a while back and a man in the audience came up to me and during the break and said, this information is fantastic. I wish some of those morons back in my office could be here. My question to you is this, do you think there's a chance he missed a very important point? Now, let's bring it home to you. What kind of coworkers do you have? What kind of employees? What kind of children? What kind of spouse? So many times we get from others exactly what we expect. Many years ago, Dr. Robert Rosenthal at Harvard University did a series of experiments with some rats. Had three groups of students, three groups of rats. He took the first group of students and said, hey, you're in luck. You're gonna be working with the genius rats. These rats are so smart, you can't believe it. Why, well, they're gonna go down to the end of the maze and nothing flat. They're gonna eat so much cheese, you better lay in an extra supply. He went to the second group of students and said, now you got the average rats. Not too bright, not too dumb, just a bunch of average rats, but they're gonna get to the end of the maze, so you better put some cheese down there. He went to the third group of students and said, you got a problem. Uh, <laughs> These rats, hey, hey, these rats are dumb dumbs. As a matter of fact, they have been inbred for so many generations, if one of them ever gets to the end of the maze, it's going to be a surprise. I wouldn't even buy any cheese. I'd just put a sign down at the end of the maze and say cheese on it. <laughs> well, for the next six weeks, under the most carefully controlled conditions you can possibly imagine, they conducted the experiments. And at the end of the six weeks, the genius rats, I mean, they had acted like genius rats. They went down to the end of the maze and nothing flat. I mean, they gained weight eating all that cheese. The average rats, well, what you expect from a bunch of average rats? Well, that's the way they performed. But those idiot rats, oh, was that ever sad? Oh, every once in a while, one of them would get down to the end of the maze, they'd stumble, stutter, stagger, and fall, you know. But you knew it was an accident when one of them did get down to the end of the maze. But here's an interesting thing. There were no genius rats. There were no idiot rats. They were all average rats. As a matter of fact, they were out of the same litter. Now let me ask you a question. What kind of kids have you got? What kind of neighbors did you have? What kind of employees do you have? Now you say, wait a minute, daggone, you're fast talking, cotton picking, high ziggler, you're talking about them rats one minute and my kids and my neighbors and my employees and eggs. Man, you gotta clarify. Let me, let, let, let me get you to clarify that a little bit for me. Well, they took it a step further. They went to one of the schools and went to the first teacher and said, you've got the genius kids. Oh, are these kids bright? I'll tell you, these kids are really outstanding. Now we expect them to do a magnificent job. Now some of them are kind of lazy. And they're going to say, oh, teacher, that's too much work. I can't get it all done. Don't you pay any attention to them. You put it on them. They can do it. Some of them are going to say, well, now, wait a minute, teacher. We don't have the right preparation. We haven't had the background for that. But you put it on them. These kids are bright. They'll get the work done. Went to the uh, teacher and said, well, now you got a bunch of average kids. You know, they're not the brightest, but they're certainly not the dumbest. They're average kids, and they're going to do average work. Well, interestingly enough, most of you at this point are probably already a little ahead of me in your thinking because you see the genius kids at the end of the first year were one year ahead of the average kids and here's where you're ahead of me because as you probably already know there were no genius kids they were all average kids but you see you treat people like you see them and the way you treat them plays a strong and important part in their productivity. You see, teacher expectation has a direct bearing on student performance. Employer expectation has a direct bearing on employee performance. I'll give you another example. About three and a half years ago, my secretary, Laura Downing, received a phone call from a lady from Birmingham, Alabama. 
And she was obviously in deep distress. And my secretary said to me, Zig, if there's a chance you could see this lady while you're over there, I believe you could help her because she really does have a problem. And I said, well, Larry, you know, I get there about two hours before I speak, invite her to come backstage and I'll be glad to talk with her. Well, the little lady walked backstage, you know, and uh, I'm not going to say that she was overweight, but she was three, four, maybe five inches too short. <laughs> and uh, as she walked in, she literally, as you've heard me say, looked like the cruise director for the Titanic. I mean, somebody had apparently licked all the red off of her candy. Uh, she, she walked in almost crying. She said, oh, she said, I'm just so glad to see you. She said, I got this job. I just absolutely hate it. Said, it's a dead end job. And said, the people down there are just awful. Said, I don't like nothing about it. She said, I want to get out of it. Can you help me? She's the kind of a lady who could brighten up a whole room you know, by leaving it, if you know what I mean. <laughs> well, I don't know how you are, but sometimes, you know, I get instant impressions. When I'm confronted with a situation like this where a lady's got a problem and I have such a short period of time to solve that problem, I don't uh, pray to the God of Abraham and Jacob and Isaac. I just say, Lord, we got us a problem. Help. Well, apparently in this particular case, uh, the prayer was answered because almost immediately I knew what I had to do. I came to a lot of conclusions in a hurry, and uh, one of them that I came to was the fact that this little lady had undoubtedly told that story before to every friend and relative and neighbor and complete stranger who would ever sit still. She would dump that big load of garbage and tell them all of her problems and all of her woe and all of her difficulties all of her life. I had a strong impression that the last thing she needed was sympathy. She did not need somebody else to listen to that story and console her with, yes, life is tough kind of a thing. She had had a lifetime of too much sympathy. What she needed was empathy. What she needed was somebody who could back away from the problem and hopefully offer a solution to some of her difficulty. I visualized in her mind that what she expected me to do was to verbally put my arm around her, tell her that life was tough, but you got to hang in there, dear, and in the long run, things are going to work out okay. I had the distinct feeling that she thought she would be leaving in a few minutes, again with my arm verbally or my arm verbally around her, telling her that she just had to be tough, you know, but that life was cruel and that she'd been dealt a raw hand and all of that sort of stuff. Well, if I had done that, I would have betrayed every single thing in which I believe. I knew that what she needed was not sympathy. What she needed was somebody who would tell her maybe not what she wanted to hear, but what she needed to hear. Now, I want to stress something. What you say is important, but the way you say it is even more important. The intent behind what you say and the tone of your voice is the most important means of communication. I want to stress that what I said, I said lovingly and I said kindly, but nevertheless, it was clear and it was distinct and it was firm. When she finally ran down, I looked at her and I said, yes, and you know, ma'am, the unfortunate thing is, I believe that your problem is going to get worse. Now, if I'd hit her in the face with a bucket of ice water, I could not have shocked her anymore. She said, well, what do you mean? I said, well, ma'am, you know, you say you don't like your job. You say it's tough. But let me stress, it is a job. And I believe your situation is going to get worse because I believe there is a distinct possibility you might lose that job. She said, well, why do you say that? I said, very simply, ma'am, I don't believe there is a company anywhere that can sustain itself with this much negative poison located in just one small spot because that will definitely spread. She said, well, what am I going to do? Well, now, folks, let me tell you in this Born to Win concept, there are a lot of people who will come to you and say they want advice when all they want you to do is agree with their position. They don't really want help. What they want is an audience. I felt it was critically important that I find out in the beginning if she really did want help or if she just wanted somebody to listen to her problem. So I specifically said, now let me ask you, do you really want help for the problem or do you just want to talk about the problem? She said, no. She said, I want help. And they tell me you help people, but you sure haven't been much help to me so far. And I said, well, ma'am, I got an idea if you're really interested. She said, well, I'll give you my word. I'm interested. I said, okay, here's what I want you to do. 
when you get home tonight, I want you to get out a sheet of paper, and I want you to list one, two, three, four, all of the things you like about your job and your company and the people you work with. She said, that'll be easy. I said, I don't like nothing about my job. <laughs> don't like nothing about the people I work with. Don't like nothing about the company. I said, now, wait a minute. Let me ask you a question. Do they pay you for working there? Well, she said, of course they pay me for working there. I said, you mean to tell me that you'd rather work for a company that doesn't pay you? Well, she said, that's crazy. Of course I want to be paid. So I said, then the first thing you like about your job is the fact they pay you for working there, don't they? She said, yes, they do. I said, okay, get your list out. We'll start it right now. The first thing you like about your job is they pay you for working there. I said, number two, let me ask you, do they pay you above average, below average, or about average for what you do? She said, well, I got to confess, they pay me a little above average for what I do. I said, do you mean to tell me you prefer to work for a company that pays you below average? Well, she said, that's silly. Of course not. I said, then the second thing you like about your job is the fact they pay you above average, don't you? Write it down. That's number two. I said, number three, do you get a vacation with pay? She said, well, certainly. I said, do you mean to tell me you want to work 52 weeks out of the year with never a day off? You don't want a vacation with pay? Well, she said, of course I want a vacation with pay. Then I said, the third thing you like about your job, to give you a vacation with pay. Write it down. That's number three. I said, number four, do you have insurance where you work? Hospitalization insurance and life insurance? Why, she said, of course. I said, you mean to tell me you don't want insurance on your job as uncertain as life is today? Why, she said, of course I want insurance. I said, then the fourth thing you like about your job is they give you insurance. I said, number five, let me ask you, do you have a retirement plan where you work? Why, she said, of course I have a retirement plan. I said, you mean to tell me you want to work until you're 100 years old and the last day they go ahead and haul you to the graveyard? Why, she said, of course not. I said, then the fifth thing you like about your job is you have a retirement program. You write it down. That's number five. I said, number six, let me ask you, where you work, does it have a roof over it, a floor under it, and walls around it? Why, she said, of course it does. I said, you mean to tell me you're the work outdoors 12 months out of the year? Why, she said, that's silly. I said, of course it's silly. The sixth thing you like about your job, they give you a building to work in. I said, number seven, let me ask you, the heat in the uh, wintertime and air conditioning in the summertime? Why, she said, of course it do. I said, you mean to tell me you're the work in a hot place in the summer and a cold place in the winter? Why, she said, of course not. I said, the seventh thing you like about your job, they give you a comfortable place to work. I said, number eight, let me ask you, they give you a place to park your car or do you have to leave it out on the street where somebody might come along and run into it? No, she said, they give me a nice spot right close to where I enter the building. I said, you mean to tell me you'd rather leave it out on the street where it might be destroyed? Why, she said, certainly not. I said, then the eighth thing you like about your job, they give you a nice place to park your car. You have reached the end of side A. Please turn the cassette over to listen to side B.